So everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so delighted to welcome you all to the first ever Swarovski Foundation In Conversation Talk. This series will address economic, environmental, and social challenges faced by society and our world. And now each month we will be inviting distinguished experts from areas such as academia, philanthropy, environmental science, and the creative industry to examine, discuss, and raise awareness around these themes. So some areas the program will explore include human rights, environmental degradation, creativity's role in problem solving, and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We will discuss the policies, the partnerships needed in the future to address challenges across these areas. And the aim of the Swarovski Foundation In Conversation program and platform is to inform, educate, and inspire our community around these topics and foster positive change. So today's topic is education, as education is one of the three pillars of the Swarovski Foundation. And we've all seen the pandemic has affected education around the world, leading to widespread school closures and furthering inequality for already vulnerable populations. According to UNICEF, 23 countries are currently implementing nationwide closures and 40 are implementing local closures, impacting about 47% of the world's student population. School closures have far-reaching consequences for the economy and society and take an emotional and psychological toll on all parties involved. And however, there are some silver linings. COVID-19 has also strengthened our resilience and adaptability. And we would like to explore some of these um, instances today. So today I'm delighted to welcome award-winning film producer and also Swarovski Foundation trustee, former dean and professor Terry Schwartz from the School of Theater, Film and Television at UCLA, and Wendy Kopp, CEO and co-founder of Teach for All and founder of Teach for America, which counts more than 6,000 corps members. Wendy and Terry have joined me today to discuss the challenges facing global education and some of the solutions, partnerships, and innovations that can address them. So thank you both for being here today. It's such an honor for us to have you as, as this first um, session, but also it's such an honor to be working with you, Terry, with you and the foundation, and Wendy as a foundation partner. We share the values and we really felt very strongly to support your mission in this world. So the first question that we have for you is that COVID-19 has resulted in school and university closures. Um, what are the main challenges around conversion to online learning and how has this affected the students, the parents and the teachers? And Terry, you um, can give us the university point of view and Wendy, it would be great to hear from the high school point of view. Okay. Wendy, would you, like to, would you like to start from the high school point of view? Sure, I can dive in and, and maybe even just looking at, I mean, K to 12, right? I mean, I think as you said, you know, maybe more than 1.5 billion kids have been out of school at some point during this pandemic um, and half of them for more than seven months. So, Clearly a huge challenge for the whole student population. Um, I guess the main challenge, I mean, first of all, I think we just need to ground ourselves in the reality that two thirds of the world's children don't have access to the internet. Um, and of course the most disadvantaged kids and the most marginalized kids, you know, who are the folks who our network work with um, are the least likely to have access. Um, so what we saw, and I think this does speak a little bit to the silver lining piece of it, was just, we really just unleashed the creativity and ingenuity of the world's teachers. And um, what we saw was that where kids were learning, teachers were just exerting tremendous leadership to make it happen. And I've seen you know, thousands of kids, I mean, remotely, I've seen it, you know, continuing to learn in villages without any electricity, not to mention, I mean, no phones and no electricity, because their teachers figured out how to make it happen, how to organize the kids to meet under trees, you know, how to create a paper distribution system and organize the teachers to, to work in, in safe ways with the students. Um, we saw teachers 
literally enlisting radio stations and TV stations and saying this is the only way we can reach kids. We saw that all around the world and now have whole communities of practice of teachers and alumni educators who are learning together across borders about how to better leverage radio and TV. Um, and then we've seen, you know, at, at various levels of technology, you know, there are, you know, we have network partners in countries where most kids do have high speed connectivity and laptops. And even in those environments, you know, there were extraordinary challenges in, in motivating the kids to engage. Um, one of the most memorable moments of this pandemic for me was meeting with a student leadership advisory council of students from 20 countries around the world about maybe it was last April or May. Um, and I still remember this student from Denmark, you know, where you, you've got the best situation in terms of connectivity and technology say honestly, only a quarter of the students were showing up and fully engaged. Um, and, you know, so huge challenges all around, um, but at the same time, I think mm -hmm. this has just, has unleashed a level of innovation that we, we, unlike what we've seen before, and there are possibilities that that generates. Terry, what would you say? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm coming from, it's, a, it's amazing the work that you've done and congratulations, Wendy, it's so impressive. And Nadia, mm -hmm. thank you for the honor of being here today and all that you're doing with the foundation, it's extraordinary. So uh, kudos all around mm -hmm. here. I'm in a very elite company, I must say. So thank, thank you for inviting me. Well, um, my experience uh, um, has been a little different than yours because I'm focused on the um, university, at the university level. And um, I'm now, um, uh, I stepped down as dean um, in 2019 and went on um, what was meant to be this last year, um, a, an academic sabbatical. And um, I was going on a world listening tour. And so I wound up doing my world listening tour in my house, you know, it's like everybody else. and. Um, but uh, many things uh, um, came up during that time. And I'm now, um, uh, as a professor, certainly teaching at the graduate level and teaching a very interesting graduate class that, that I invented during, during my sabbatical um, year and had to adapt to, mm. to this new environment. And, you know, it, it was, it's been very interesting. I just want to talk about our faculty uh, and students in, in general. When the pandemic hit, uh, the faculty and staff at our UCLA School of Theater, Fil Film and Television, we have amazing faculty and staff and students, of course. Um, but they had 48 hours in which to literally turn around the entire educational system within across the university and within our school. And we are a school that largely makes things. So we have directors who direct on sound stages and in, on location. We have actors who act on stages. We have theater directors and designers and playwrights and screenwriters and, and scholars and researchers. So it was an extraordinary challenge to figure out how to adapt to a digital um, Zoom environment, basically, with those who actually make things in a physical space. Mm -hmm. And um, so uh, uh, congratulations and to our faculty and staff. And, and, you know, I used to say, well, we're show folk. When did we ever have any money and have any resources, tools to do anything? We, we figure it out. And I think artists create, uh, um, that's what they do every day is that they create, they invent, they innovate and found ways to, to adapt their syllabi, um, the pedagogy itself into a digital environment, but uh, over four, it took, they had 48 hours in which to turn the entire system around. And, you know, again, what one found was um, uh, at the beginning, the challenge was, um, uh, you know, the technological challenges. It had uncovered some of the things that you were talking about in terms of um, those that did not have internet access or high speed internet access or good internet connection. Um, some students who didn't have laptops and had to use the libraries to use uh, laptops and uh, the libraries were closed. So the libraries had to figure out how to um, 
adapt into this new environment to deliver basic library services digitally. You know, so the entire ecosystem within the university had to change at both the undergraduate and graduate level. For my new class, I had to figure out how to adapt into a virtual space. And it's a graduate seminar. And um, being in the Zoom environment for almost a year, um, I, I think that it, it taught me a lot because I went to a lot of conferences and virtual fest film festivals and webinars and, and talks like, like these. So I challenged myself to innovate in ways to deliver a class that would be both you know, fresh and engaging and, and as interactive as possible. And I must say that enthusiasm goes a long way. One of the things, there are a lot of intangible things that come up. And I think enthusiasm, being optimistic, being positive, that needs to break through the Zoom plane, the digital plane and setting up a, a classroom mm -hmm. where everybody has to have their um, camera on, their video on, so that we could see each other and go in gallery view so that we could all see each other rather than going big, little, big, you know. And so they're just little things that make it more um, immediate and, and, connect, and connective. Um, but, you know, I think great teaching or at least good teaching, or hopefully good teaching for me, but is, uh, is ultimately about sharing. And if I'm going to be a good teacher, I need to share and generously share my knowledge and my experiences and give that to the students. So, um, you know, my, I set up the sil syllabus in such a way that it would be where I'd be able to share my knowledge. And um, I think that uh, in a three hour seminar, another thing that I, I, and it's in the evening on a Monday nights, um, I decided to break up the time so that time didn't feel flat over three hours. Mm -hmm. So I really have mixed it up with a combination of um, visual presentations. Um, and then, and then uh, we have some breaks in the action, but I, every week I have visual presentations, I have distinguished guests, and I have dynamic conversation. And the students have to be prepared with three questions each week. So they're gonna get called on and they have to be on their toes. Um, so everybody's like ready to go. And yeah. I have found that I've tried to replicate what it would be like if we were together in the room and by mixing it up, um, I have found that everybody is really on their toes, really engaged. Um, and which, and they're bringing tremendous enthusiasm. I just love our students. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I also break up the time, for example, um, I'm, I'm doing a brand new class on festival strategies and which is unique to our world. And I sent them to Sundance on Sunday. So instead of class on Monday night, they got to go to the festival for the entire day, Sunday and Sunday night, see films, go to panels. Um, and so I by to be in your classes, Terry, I have to say that that was so beautiful to hear what you were describing because it's what we've seen too. And, yeah. you know, Denmark student who I mentioned, you know, okay. she literally said what we've seen in this era is that there are some teachers who just want to teach content and some mm -hmm. teachers who want to teach kids. And she was trying to describe that the teachers who had relationships with the students and were determined to build a sense of community among them yeah. and to keep them engaged through this era were the only ones who actually kept kids learning. So we talk about mm -hmm. a digital divide, but I think so much we've seen is we have a, a leadership divide you know it's kind of learning where teachers did whatever it took learning, mm -hmm. whether they were in a high-tech environment or in a low-tech one mm -hmm. exactly do you know and um also being in a in a uh using the frame as it were i'm very visual anyway but and i like to and i think both of you are the same way read the room so how do you read the room in a digital space but by keeping everybody in a gallery view while the students are engaging, I'm actually watching everybody. The eyeballs. I'm watching everybody and getting a sense of their movement. You know, um, are they listening? What are they doing? You know, and I'm getting to know our, and our, and our students are incredible. I just, I just um, really admire them. And by the way, they're all over the world. They're stuck in their home countries, you know, and so they're having to adapt to Los Angeles time, but it could be the middle of the night for, for them. And I've also had guests from all over the world. I had one guest come in from Beirut to talk about her festival strategies. And 
um, another from your other parts of Europe. And, and, and uh, it's just, it's been great. I have found that people have been incredibly generous. And the last thing I'll just say, and I'm going to not talk anymore, is that um, I think the other intangibles that have come up that I think are really key that the pandemic has shown us in education is that I find that students, faculty, and staff are more actively compassionate. Um, I think the Zoom environment has, has demanded that you become a better listener because you mm -hmm. can't talk over each other. So there's more collegiality and listening, I'm finding. Um, I think, you know, ethical considerations are much more front and center, how to be generous of heart. Um, and I, I, I just like the kind of value proposition of what has happened in a Zoom environment in education. Can you elaborate about that a little bit? I find it so interesting that the, you know, despite yeah. the, or because of the technology, it has ignited that ethical. Yeah, well, we, we talk a lot more about uh, social impact, how to use the power of story. And, you know, this is a focus for, for me, how to use the power of story for good and for change and to enlighten and to inspire. So we keep that front and center. The issues around diversity and inclusion, I have, I have um, embedded into my syllabus for all 10 weeks and how that plays out across uh, the, uh, the entertainment industry and how it's playing out across the festival landscape in particular. What films are chosen? Who's choosing them? And my guests are quite diverse. So this notion around racial um, justice and racial equity, um, I think are active conversations that we have. Um, and, you know, issues around the environment and health and uh, how the arts can be used to enlighten and engage and what you're doing with your stories. But I, I do think that somehow this Zoom environment has created better listeners, uh, more awareness around compassion and empathy for others, mm -hmm. because not every student, every student has their own challenge, whether it's a psychological, emotional. I've had a student who's gotten yeah. COVID and comes to class when the student can. You know, I mean, there's a lot of things that, that have come up during this time, but to me, the silver mm -hmm. lining is more the the uh, the value proposition that that the this environment has demanded of all of us so and that's so incredible we've also yeah. really seen that in this era you just realize all the more the power and importance of relationships in this and you know i've heard this from network teachers all over the world that you know before they they built relationships with with the students parents but during this era it just became completely like you have nothing if you can't work with the parents and and if you haven't you know if you're not understanding really what the circumstances of each kid is and and we've also heard this from students that they're taking the initiative to make sure that their peers are doing okay and that they're also recognizing the humanity of their teachers so i i really what you're saying really resonates with what we've heard, you know, in very diverse contexts around the world. Yeah, you know, we've also talked a lot about the emotional toll, the the challenge for for the students, but I think as much attention needs to be paid on the teachers and what they've had to do to be able to adapt, which has been profound, actually, mm -hmm. you know, um, and also for the families who. I know I invited one person to be a guest in my class and, and she said to me, I would love to, but my entire house has been turned into a third grade classroom and I can't actually do it this quarter, but I'll do it again when, when we go back. Um, so parents have had quite a time as well having to, um, you know, juggle, you know, so mm -hmm. many things and certainly for, you know, working parents, how do you, how do you go to work if you are, if you're, a frontline worker and mm -hmm. have you, you know, I'm sure Wendy, you've seen a, a lot of this in, in, uh, across your, you know, yeah. Ecosystem. yeah. So. so it sounds like there are also so many benefits that are coming out of this. How will these benefits have an impact or play out after people are allowed to go back to the classrooms? 
all those positive elements of online. I mean, I'm, we're thinking so much about, about this question, um, in part because we're recognizing, you know, how the, the severe risks that this generation faces. I mean, um, you know, literally half of the world's kids, when they're out of school, learn nothing at all. And, and we all know that there's been so much, so many other impacts as well. I mean, especially for the most disadvantaged kids, like, least likely to be in safe spaces. And it's, it's just been so hard on people's kind of mental health and, and such. Um, so our thought is that if we don't really maximize this moment to take advantage of the new innovations that we've discovered in this era to accelerate progress, we're going to have a real issue. But as you say, we're really genuinely encouraged by the possibilities. I mean, it's almost, it's like we unleashed our educators they've been able to leave the the standard box of education as we've known it and we really are seeing just huge innovation so first of all as you say with technology which has just you know done so much i mean from you know first of all even in the environments we've seen where like i think about this um this cohort of teachers in pakistan who we're teaching, you know, 50 girls in a class. And there's a woman named Rabia Shadri who said, you know, she created a WhatsApp school. You know, her, she found a way for her kids to access phones and data. Um, and she said, we'll never use the WhatsApp school because it's just enabled a completely different level of, first of all, student ownership. Like, you know, they are driving their education. They can watch the videos as many times as they need. It's enabled a different level of differentiation, a different level of individual communication between the teachers and the students. And I think in just that one example, you sort of see the power of technology for really putting students in the driver's seat. Mm -hmm. um, we've also seen how much easier and more accessible technology has made teaching and learning. I mean, as one example, a group of about 50 Teach First teachers in the UK developed um, essentially a digital schoolhouse. It's like 10,000 lessons, very high quality lessons with all the associated materials and assessments, um, which any student teacher or you know, anyone, parent can access. So for every you know, grade level and subject area and course objective, you can just go to this video bank. It had 22 million watched lessons by the end of May last year alone. I don't know what this year's statistics are, but you know, they're saying they'll never lose that because and, and at any point a teacher can focus their energy on mentoring, on small group instruction and leverage really high quality lesson plans. And we've seen something similar in India. Um, there's so much to be said here under the realm of just technology innovation, but I do think we've kind of, there was a lot of inertia, I think, about leveraging technology in education. And, and you know, I think this kicked us over the hump on that and that the possibilities are huge. I think that's amazing. And is the telephone really also a substitute, for example, for those households that might not have the laptop? Well, here's another, I mean, I was just on the, on a Zoom with, with some fellows from Teach for Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm they have very little connectivity. And they said, oh, but what we've done is we've take the, taken this very outdated curriculum from Zimbabwe and we've recorded like updated short curriculum segments on MP3 players. I don't even know, what is that, like a tape recorder? And they said, that's the available technology. And I was saying, but is that an innovation you're gonna keep or is this just to survive the era? And they said, oh no, it's gonna be so helpful because the kids miss so much school. This is, they're in an area where there are many, many rains. They said the girls are not going to school at least a week a month. And now they'll always be able to learn. So it's another example of where we don't even, you know, I think one thing we've seen is that we really need to be cognizant of how different the technology levels are and use the available technology. But even with something that simple, we can make huge gains. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And you have such a huge international infrastructure. Um, do you, I just assume, or maybe you can uh, talk about that a little bit. How do the different teachers interact with each other and share their learnings, which might be from country to country relevant or helpful? Yeah. I mean, I think that's been one of the more, you know, we had built a, a network prior to COVID and there was already a lot of cross-border learning and sharing. But I think in this era where it just became so abundantly clear that we're all, 
were in very similar boats. Um, there just became such an appetite for that. And so, you know, as you know, Nadia, we're a network of these independent organizations in 59 countries and growing, but we have built a very, a lot of connectivity between not only the staff members of these organizations, but the teachers and alumni. So for example, you know, last April, we had 1500 teachers from countries all over the world in teaching without internet WhatsApp groups in four different languages, just trading solutions. Like how do we keep kids learning when we don't have access to the internet? And as I mentioned earlier, we have, I mean, now we have 43 communities of practice among teachers and alumni. So for example, all these former teachers who are now working in their government's ministries, former Teach for All Network teachers who were responsible for figuring out how do we open schools? Like how do we balance the risks to kids and adults and all? They're thinking with each other and trading solutions about how to actually do that well. And you just think how much better their decisions will be because they were able to leverage the insights from across 20 countries. Um, so we've really seen the power of, of for just truly accelerating impact um, of cross-border learning and sharing. Yeah, so interesting, fascinating. You know, and that is it, it's, it's interesting, you know, we, in the, in the arts, um, uh, you know, not only do we think it can inspire and inspire change, but it's also can be used to heal. And um, uh, I think that any kind of arts education that can also be brought in, in terms of creative expression, writing, uh, telling your stories, I think it's really important for the students, uh, and especially in your ecosystem, is to share their stories across borders. Is I think story, as you've often heard me say, is going to save our world. And I call us the storytelling school, but there may be a way to embed, embed story into, um, into your ecosystem. And it's so important to do it at, a, at a, actually a younger level, having yeah. done writing programs for uh, you know, uh, high school students. It's been, uh, you know, very powerful. But there's a there's something that we we've been using um, as an experiment in the Zoom environment. We've been taking um, game engines like Unreal, which is one of the most popular game engines in the world. And um, again, this level of innovation is how do we create, um, since the actors and the designers and the theater directors, the playwrights can't go into the theater at the moment because we are in lockdown um, and it's not safe to do so, obviously. How can we still put on a show? Do you know, how can we still have a play? How can we still, you know, do something interesting that that, that cohort of students can work? So taking um, with our uh, digital media students in concert with our with the you know sort of in an interdisciplinary approach with the artists, scholars, and digital um, artists and digital media students, um, they've been using game engines to um, to create uh, works. As for example, each student who each actor will be sent a green screen kit at their home because they're like scattered all over the country and all over the world, so they are shipped out from us a green screen kit with a little green screen that goes behind them, a couple of lights, um, a laptop that has all the software embedded from the game engine. And, um, and uh, yeah, and what we can do is we could actually, even though you're in many different locations, we can put you through the game engine in real time into the same location. So it looks like you are acting together um, in an environment. Now the environment, because it's kind of um, rudimentary at this point, but the environment will look more like a game, a game environment, you know, 3D um, motion graphics, animation, but it's real actors. It's our students in the environment together and with the directors directing them via almost like a telev live television show where they're going camera one, camera two, like in the, the, using sort of old, old technology and new technology. They're able to get the, the students to be looking in the right direction and, mm -hmm. um, and to be acting out the text and to be moving through environments that the designers are designing. The costume designers are working with the students with their clothes. That's and so... Hilarious. I, there, there could be ways with, in the, in, these are very sophisticated things that we're doing, but certainly 
as we begin to play with the technology, this might be something that could be used across the, you know, the whole teach for echo. Yeah, system. it sounds like it. That would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. Right there. Yeah, but again, it's that example of, if you have lemons, make lemonade, you know? It's yeah. Just, we have all these tools like laying around, what can we do with them? And, um, and we're seeing some extraordinary innovation happening. Um, in have you society. seen results yet? I mean, have you seen little films or trailers yet? Um, I've, I've actually- Looking at new technology? I have. Um, I actually uh, had funded a summer institute, which it was year three this, la this last summer. And um, it's w what we call our future uh, storytelling institute or a summer institute. And um, it went, it, they, the students signed up and faculty and staff and over a four week period, they uh, took a text and they worked through the whole piece and then had two, um, two showings as it were. They were like um, works in progress or rehearsals in progress. But I went, you know, every week to see what they were doing, meaning in my house on Zoom. Yeah. And then I would go into the rehearsals and see. And it was extraordinary. I mean, uh, I, you know, there's nothing for us to show here. But um, I would say that, that as we're beginning to embed this into our program, as long as we're in the Zoom environment, I actually think this is something that's going to stick. And we will be working in this um, way uh, on a number of projects for years to come. And, and also mm -hmm. like we're right. talking about asynchronous versus synchronous learning, you know, th I, I think that that's here to stay as well. There will be lectures, mm -hmm. other things that we could record that students could look at uh, on their own time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I think so too. More, more seminar kind of situations where it's very dynamic and very dynamic conversation and very interactive. Um, so the, I, yeah. Yeah, well, sorry. Yeah, no, the other thing we've just really seen in this era is that it's almost, you know, we've seen the opportunity to make education a more collective endeavor. Like the number of innovations we've seen around, first of all, like really investing in parents as partners. Um, mm -hmm. I just saw a beautiful example of the Enseña por Mexico teachers using social media, Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups and such to essentially share almost like lessons on child development with parents of very young kids and then surface from the parents examples of them living into this guidance. Um, you know, I saw a beautiful example in Romania and also in Peru where they're basically saying, what did the kids want to be? They want to be an astronaut. We can bring an astronaut to the classroom. You want to be a poet, we can bring a poet. So this idea that we can break down the walls of the classroom using the available technology um, and, and involve many more people in ensuring this generation thrives. Like, I just think that's another realm um, of, of innovation that has a lot of potential to accelerate progress. I, I agree. I think we've really yeah. democratized in the, the process in many ways. Um, for example, you know, I'm doing festival strategies, which is something that applies to the world that, I, that I'm in and is typically not taught. And um, uh, what I have found with the, the virtual film festivals, they all had to Nobody could have a film festival this last year in person. So whether it was the Cannes Film Festival or Toronto or the Sundance, which I just went to, they all went virtual. And what has been so extraordinary, just watching the process of this, is that it has taken um, these venues and these gatherings, which tend to be very rarefied, uh, one, they're expensive to get to, um, not everybody can get a pass, um, you know, it's meant for a certain mm -hmm. kind of community. It has really democratized it so that the that going to the festivals, one, for those who couldn't afford to get to Park City for Sundance, well, you don't mm -hmm. have to buy a plane ticket now. You don't have, if you're a student, you don't have to buy a plane ticket. You don't have to like search, search around for, mm -hmm. probably you won't even get a hotel, a hotel or a motel room or, you know, sleeping on the floor of somebody who has a condo, you know, if you're that kind of student experience. Um, but it's really democratized it. So not only for students, faculty, and other 
um, and others who are professionals in the community who might not be able to afford to go. But it's also invited the public into the experience, which I think is really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So now you have the best curated films in the world that are available before they're released to, um, to yep. the widest possible audience. So you've got the public worldwide, uh, also who can engage in conversation now uh, mm -hmm. around the films because there's chat rooms that uh, accompany the films and that you could ask questions and the filmmakers are there and everybody shows up because you everybody shows up in a Zoom environment. You don't have to fly mm -hmm. anywhere. Um, so you have all, all of the actors and the, and the artists, the filmmakers, the writers showing up in conversations after their films. The public is invited in. And for students and faculty and staff, it's an opportunity to be able to go and not disrupt your teaching schedule. Um, mm -hmm. And also for others within the filmmaking and, and sort of streaming, what is now the streaming community itself, um, has been really quite a phenomenon of the pandemic and how festivals have had to re literally reinvent themselves to stay alive. You know? But it's amazing to see how they have reinvented themselves and have not let the pandemic get in the way. And exactly. I think it's so wonderful to hear that positive side effect, namely the democratization. We see that also are very similar phenomenons in the fashion industry. You know, more people can, you know, it's virtual. Uh, people can attend, it's open to the public. Okay. So it's very interesting that this restriction actually have, has been a complete door opener. Yeah. And speaking of education, it's, it, you know, the subject matter is available to the general public, therefore educating it. It's very, it's fascinating. Well, exactly. You know, I, you know, there have, there are those, there are many silver linings. And I mm -hmm. think that uh, those of us who come from the arts, who come from education, tend to be, uh, have that kind of optimistic spirit, glass half full, we can, we can get it done. But it has taken its toll on a lot of people too. I, I think that there have been a, a faculty who've had a harder time adapting, uh, using technology to teach their classes that perhaps they've been teaching in a certain way for a very long time. Mm -hmm. The emotional toll, I think that has, that, you know, students, parents, faculty have had to endure over this last year. So, you know, we try to be very mindful, very mindful of those who are, uh, those who are um, lagging behind a little bit in this as well. I mean, it, it, mm -hmm. has, it has been hard and very challenging mm -hmm. for a lot of people. It sounds like in both situations, um, the teacher is really uh, so instrumental and detrimental. And Terry, I think you're giving us such a good example of such a positive teacher, a uh, teacher that really have, has come up with, with tremendous problem solving. Um, but can I just ask you, Wendy, how do you manage? Because I think that's always been a mantra for you, you know, the power of the teacher to influence the students. And you've done, your results have been so phenomenal. Uh, we see your grade point averages going up compared to the um, normal schooling system, which is amazing. Yeah. But how do you really train the teachers and keep the teachers encouraged and up to date and motivated? Yeah, um, I mean, I really, you know, it really resonates what Terry is sharing about, you know, even the well-being of the teachers. You know, I think that was our first you know, we have to take care of ourselves to be strong for students. And what we saw our network partners doing was just creating spaces to help people process and, and think together. And, and we were doing that at the global level and they were doing that at the national and, and local levels. And I think, you know, being able to come together with others made such a difference in terms of, you know, just helping people you know, center, find support, and and also find their way to seeing the new possibilities. Um, what we've really seen across our network, I mean, I guess when schools shut down, you know, what, what do you have other than, you know, you, you go to your most innovative, creative teachers um, and education leaders. And alongside many others, I think our network teachers could step into this moment. And we've just really seen I mean, they have among themselves trained tens of thousands of teachers around the world. Um, they've, they've done so many things to try to influence kids on their 
own um, as you know, tech savvy teachers, because they're of course from a, a pretty young generation um, and create again, the digital schoolhouses. And um, I, I think this era has just, I mean, we've really tried to center ourselves in the principles of keeping kids safe and learning, recognizing as Terry said that I mean, the kids least likely to be safe and learning are, are in yeah. the kind of most under-resourced communities. Um, you know, while so looking for the new possibilities um, so that we can, you know, work towards accelerating progress. I mean, I think what we keep telling ourselves is the kids we're working with were already, I mean, you know, if you look at the average is not on a path to thriving. You know, I think about the low income and middle income countries, it's like 53% of 10 year olds are not able to read or they're not in school at all. And now people are predicting and, and the agencies are predicting that that's going to be 63%, right? If we don't figure out how to come back better. Um, but that's our thought is that we can, we can come back better and we can make sure that that 53% number is no longer 53%, right? And, but that's going to depend on leadership. It's, it's all of us, right? It's like, can we step back? And, and really, it will be, I mean, not us at the global level, it will be all about the local leadership. You know, will there be enough locally rooted leadership necessary? And I think that's what will ultimately differentiate the communities and the countries that, that, do, that do better than others. Mm -hmm. now, Wendy, one of the things, that, as you were talking, thank you for sharing that, it's so interesting. Um, the foundation um, supports so many, you know, different extraordinary um, um, organizations, but the the one, uh, not just the one, but one of the most significant um, initiatives within the foundation and uh, Swarovski writ large is the uh, water school programs, and which are extraordinary. And, you know, these are in the, some of the most underserved communities in the world, but the curriculum is so interesting in terms of environmental um, education uh, focused on, you know, water, hygiene, sanitation, very basic um, elements that apply to the communities that the water schools serve. And um, what also underscores, I think, the, um, the approach to the education are something that we were talking about earlier and may also apply to this in conversation overall, which is if we have a chance to now re to invent, reinvent, reimagine, if we're in this Goldilocks moment where we can seize this, then I think at the core should be a couple of things. And I think Water School does this so well, which is going back to what we were talking about earlier, which is to embed in the curriculum ethics, empathy, compassion, knowing how to listen, very basic uh, generosity, um, resilience, imagination, these kinds of uh, values, a value, value, values approached uh, to, to the education, and then visual literacy, um, because the, the children coming up as we were talking about earlier, that the cell phone becomes a ubiquitous tool or WhatsApp or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. visual literacy co coupled with um, these kinds of values embedded inside a, any um, approach, any curriculum, any yeah. down to the syllabus, which is the actual piece that you use in the classroom, you know. Um, yeah. For me, looking to the future, we can harness this digital world for good uh, and then reimagine and uh, use these, like Water School does, I think, uh, use that as the foundation yeah. for everything that we do. Yeah. I mean, I just cannot agree more with you. This is actually my very greatest hope for this era that, that kind of, and I, I'm seeing so much so many encouraging signs. Like I think, you know, everyone from students to parents to educators are thinking much more critically about what we're working towards in education. Um, there's such a greater awareness of the importance of fostering student agency so that they're 
driving their education. They're solving the problems around themselves. Um, there's such a greater appreciation about the importance of focusing on student well-being and mental health and social emotional skills. Um, and my biggest hope really is that we won't just go back into the old box, but we'll really mm -hmm. gather mm -hmm. communities and countries to almost really, we need to rethink the purpose of education. Like what is our vision of the future and what are the implications of that for what we need to be working towards mm -hmm. in our schools? And I think that's what they've done in the water school. And it's what so many of the wonderful schools, uh, you know, that mm -hmm. are familiar with around the world, like the, the islands of excellence are doing. Um, we really just need a worldwide, you know, orientation towards ensuring, I mean, of course, the kids in our classrooms today, what's going on there is what we're going to have in the world in the future. So we really need to step back and, and kind of reconsider what we're working towards. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, okay. it, it'll be interesting to see the shift in balance between just hardcore curriculum, but also the emotional state of the children or that the uh, implementation of values or the dressing of values. And actually last week at the World Economic Forum, somebody, uh, one of the teachers from, professors from the University of Pennsylvania did mention that the entire grading system needs to be questioned. Of course, everyone needs to, this is assuming that students put in their best effort, but so often the anxiety of having to take an exam and having to do well absolutely shuts the student down from learning. So it's very interesting to see how um, the world will evolve yeah. in terms of that. But on that note, very quickly, just in terms of emotional state and also in terms of equality uh, and the different you know, balance that we saw in the world, can I just address one issue, namely that of girls? Do you see a difference between male and female students and how they might be more positively or negatively affected uh, by this entire situation? Um, I mean, I think there's a lot of just worldwide concern about the welfare of girls right now, just given that what we've seen in past crises, like the Ebola crisis and, and the countries most affected by that, for example, was that there were just disproportionate impacts on girls. Um, you know, higher mm -hmm pregnancy rates, um, much greater chance of early marriage because the families are so worried about their economic welfare uh, and don't feel that they have a choice. Um, and, and just, and a lot of other impacts around girls, girls' safety, their access to, you know, menstrual health and reproductive, you know, materials, you know, and, and services that are school-based often. Um, I guess it's another instance though where what we do now in communities matters. Um, mm. And so you can see, like I've seen these incredible efforts around the world to make sure that all those, you know, materials that were delivered at schools are now delivered at homes. For example, there are a couple of Teach for Nigeria fellows who are just doing such amazing work in, in helping girls, you know, ensure their well-being during this time, essentially. Um, you know, and, and, and so we don't know. We don't know what the, the ultimate statistics will be. Um, I know there are just many, many efforts across our network and, and far beyond to protect the welfare of girls in this era, but we need to be very concerned about the disproportionate mm -hmm. impact, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do think that uh, obviously women and girls, uh, and this is anecdotal, I don't have the statistics around this, but it's just an impression. Um, is is that they're oftentimes the the first to be um, impacted by you know a crisis like this. So um, mm -hmm. you know women have to have to you know perhaps give up their job. Um, and this, these are first world issues that we're finding. You know because mm -hmm. now they have to be home to um, teach the kids in the in a one room apartment. You know. Mm -hmm. um, and also there's been a rise in domestic violence because. Um, people have been, had to stay home and the ones that are impacted typically the most would be women and girls by domestic violence. Boys are impacted as well. And I think there are a lot of issues for boys, you know, um, uh, during this time as well. But like Swarovski, again, uh, the foundation partners with Room to Read, I think they have, 
they have supported over 1,100 um, girls and you know that are in very marginalized communities um, in India and Vietnam. You know, I, I'm not sure if you're uh, in, in the Teach for ecosystem if you're working with them, but I know that there are organizations all over the world that are that and specifically that's that the foundation is supporting um, brilliantly. I might add um, with this focus on. Um, uh, not only education for women and girls, but also their safety, their health, um, yeah. racial just, you know, uh, racial and environmental justice, which impact women and girls as well. So, yeah. Um, we too have, yeah. yeah, no, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. No, uh, we've just, we, we too have seen, again, it's, it's like all about local leadership. So we, we actually created a few years ago, but we're growing it in this era of virtual girls education fellowship, where at any given time, we have a hundred girls fellows who are engaging with the world's experts on girls education and what needs to happen, but then are working to develop projects in their communities to address you know, the threats, the very real threats to girls right now. Um, so I think all, all of these efforts, the ones that you're funding, um, you know, this, this, is, this is all we can do right now. I mean, the resilience of communities in terms of everything from education, health, economic strength will all be about essentially the strength of the local leadership in those communities. Um, so everything we can do to strengthen those local leaders and help them learn together across borders, I think this will be the key to, you know, ultimately putting the world on a different trajectory, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. I mean, it seems absolutely what you just said, absolutely universal, no matter what country we're dealing with, no matter what um, school level we're dealing with. Um, so I think it's, it's, thank you so much, both of you, for your tremendous insight. It sounds like, yes, we are facing so many challenges, but um, the human resilience has really kind of led a very positive path forward together with innovation, the leadership, an emphasis on the values and Wendy community. And I guess this is really what the digitalization will also help us do. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. guess, Terry, on the sake from the foundation, I guess every drop counts, every drop matters. Every drop. Uh, we try to have that positive impact and spread the message. Yeah, I uh, think that, I think. I think that, uh, sorry I interrupted you, but I think yeah. thinking strategically this way, that these are not bifurcated, but to bringing together these issues based on sort of a foundation of these values that we're talking about, um, I think we have a real opportunity now um, mm -hmm. to, to make some significant changes. I, yeah. I think we'll start seeing that in the, in the US, you know, we, I don't want to get into any politics, but certainly we have new leadership coming in uh, for uh, education in our country, and we're and it's tied to racial justice, it's tied to um, the environment, it's tied to health security. It'll be very interesting to see how education starts to take a new shape um, with a 21st century mindset, you know, as we move forward, and how mm -hmm. that plays out around the world. There may be um, you know, uh, uh, lessons in, that we can take away from this new approach that could be applied, that can be applied universally around the world. Mm -hmm. But I do want to go back to water school. I think water school is a great example of how at the local level uh, values, practical education, uh, using both the most low tech uh, tools and mm -hmm. a few digital tools and putting them into a network where the knowledge is shared uh, is a great um, is a great uh, example of what one can do, um, and with sort of mindful funding as well. Yeah. So everybody yeah. plays a part. Everybody has a role to play in this ecosystem, in this story. And mm -hmm. I think once, and I think that the pandemic has begun to show people what part they can play in mm -hmm. this, this story that we're telling. So mm -hmm. it's, it's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Well, listen, we have some questions from the audience, and I'd like to read one of them, which is very interesting. Namely, what do you think the effect of COVID-related educational challenges today will have in 20 years' time um, when the students of today are in the workforce 
then? It'll be really interesting to see, right? Um, I think it's in our hands still, you know, to this discussion, like, will we, first of all, prioritize education and young people, in addition to prioritizing all the health concerns and the food security issues and, and the economic issues that are also so critical. But I think we need to recognize that we do have, we have both an education crisis and therefore an education opportunity. And I think it's very mm -hmm. possible that we'll see this generation thrives more than ever because they have to be resilient and they grew in their agency and because we finally decided we need to reimagine our education system. So I'm, I'm choosing to be optimistic despite mm -hmm. all the many yeah. pieces of evidence that we have a long, you know, we have a big mountain to climb. Yeah, yeah I think in 20 years, um, the human story is thousands of years old and basically hasn't changed. So um, I think that who we are as human beings in 20 years will be, um, Hopefully we'll be telling stories with heart and with um, a sense of empathy and imagination. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I think storytelling is the constant, it's universal and it's, um, and it's timeless. So in 20 years, I think that uh, the, so the, the specifics of the stories might be different, but I think the under, the, the sort of foundational parts of our human story will be about our heart, about our community, how we connect it with our families, our friends. And mm -hmm. I think those are just timeless stories that we're gonna tell. And I think we're going to clearly be in another, uh, another world tech, uh, in terms of technology. You know, mm -hmm. we're gonna have, we're gonna have uh, cars that drive themselves and you know, it'll be, maybe we'll be like living in the Jetsons world at that point, um, I'm not sure. I think AR and, uh, you know, digital tools like augmented reality will be part of our everyday life that we use. I think um, mm -hmm. we will have moved to tablets and I, I just think the, the whole digital piece will be co completely different. And VR, AR, I actually think AR will be the ubiquitous tool in the future or some forms of mixed reality. But mm -hmm. I think under underneath that, the human story is timeless, and that that uh, is the constant. And um, but hopefully, mm -hmm. this time will have made us better listeners and more empathetic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and uh, what both of you have said actually feeds into the next question, which was, um, what do you think are the skills that young people will need to learn to thrive personally as well as professionally, and to contribute to a world becoming a better place post-COVID times? I think Gary laid out so many of them. Um, I mean, we think a lot in terms of agency, like kids sense of responsibility and their sense of possibility that they can change things, awareness of the world and, and, and our place in it. Um, you know, the set of dispositions and mindsets, um, you know, ability to collaborate with others and build strong relationships and a growth mindset of, you know, continuous kind of growth and, and learning and improvement. Um, and then, of course, the just proficiencies, the ability to solve problems and think critically and, um, and such. So, but holistic development of students and, and mm -hmm. values, you know, like, are we orienting towards essentially fostering students' leadership? I mean, that, that's what it all comes down to in, in our thinking students can shape a better future for themselves and for all of us who can navigate an uncertain world, solve increasingly complex problems and improve both their own, you know, like get on a path to meaningful careers and strengthen our collective welfare. I, I'm just wondering what those careers are going to be in the future. Do you know, I think that we're, that as we move towards um, a digital and green uh, uh, economy, there's going to be an entirely new generation yeah. of, of careers and professions and jobs uh, for, for men and for women. I think um, this notion of collaboration, of community, um, again, going back to the values that we had talked about, are going to be really critical to, to kind of layer into the, into the, the 
into the classroom itself, you know, into the syllabi themselves, because that's where the education is delivered. But mm -hmm. I also have so much hope with this generation, you know, this young generation. They are so smart and so aware, and they are thinking about other things than we were thinking about. You know, they're very aware of the in issues around the environment, and their heroes are environmental activists. And I'm talking about kids in the third world. You know, I look at the water school kids and, you know, they're in the most underserved communities. And yet, mm -hmm. I, I have a lot of hope for this new generation, uh, this young, this younger generation. They are amazing. And I do think they're resilient. And they are so, um, because they have access to so much information, and hopefully it's monitored well, but be, they are just so much more aware of the world and the issues yeah. in the world. And they tend to be much more activist oriented. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about politics so much as they're, um, they're passionate um, about issues that will impact their lives for the future. So talking mm -hmm. about agency, I think that they are a generation of, of, of real agency. I know mm -hmm. my generation, we didn't have any agency. Do you know what I yeah. mean? It's just, it is, you were told. I mean, it was just like, that's how you learned. That's how you went into certain professions, you did certain things, and a few of us broke through, but, you know, not, mm -hmm. not many, you know, if you kind of followed a certain path. I love this young generation. They are incredible. And um, so I think if we just keep pushing forward these kind of good values and, and um, issues around racial justice, environmental justice, you know, exactly. all of these, these issues that have, that the pandemic has accelerated into, yeah. I think, I, I think that will be, a, you know, it's going to be quite different for the future. And I think that we will have very interesting leaders. It'll be very different than us. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that is great. Thank you so much. I have to say, I appreciate um, both of you, and it's because of your leadership, your values, um, your insight. Um, the world will become a better place and certainly uh, will impact the fields that you're in. And um, thank you so much for your insight. And stay tuned for our next um, session where we certainly are going to dive in deeper into the topics that you've mentioned today, community, environment, leadership in general, um, sustainability. So, but thank you so much, both of you. It was such an inspiration to see you, to hear you. And I just want to thank you on behalf of the Sloan Foundation and all of us here today of the wonderful thank work you. that you're doing. Really, you're thank you so much for hosting. Amazing role models. Thank, thank you, you for hosting this. And good luck, Wendy. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you, both too. of you. And thank very you. happy to be your student. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be the best thank student anytime. I would love to have you both. It would be great. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, you all. Thank you all. Bye. 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 Bye.